to begin the class session. First of all, subscribe to our channel. I will say to the YouTube audience is to please subscribe and click or uh, whatever it is that you do on the like. Thumbs up so that we can get uh, more uh, exposure, hopefully. to the John Ray channel. <laughs> to click on thumbs up, I like. Thank you. Yes. We ready? We're ready. All right. Let me tell you that we're doing lesson number five today. First of all, let me say Happy New Year yes. to everybody, even though it's the second day of the year. I said Happy New Year to you yesterday, but uh, I doubt that you heard me. But now that we're all gathered together here on the second day of the year, I can say Happy Happy New Year to you. And we're going to do lesson number five in this particular quarter. We're studying the Gospel by Luke. And today... It's called Christ Challenges Conventional Thinking. Well, let me tell you, um, I don't mean to compare myself to Christ, but for, um, for my virtually my entire life, and I learned this from my daddy, so it's not original with me. But I learned to challenge conventional thinking and, and, and do things for myself. I challenge that statement. Yeah, well, you, can, you can all you want. Because, but here's, here's the thing. What I'm building up to is we're studying the Gospel of Luke, but I want to start in the book of Matthew today, chapter 20. So I would like you to turn, open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 20. I'm only going to read three or four verses, and, and then we'll go um, to Luke and, and read some, uh, some things in there other than our um, um, study text for today which is the first 24 verses of Luke chapter 14. That's our study text. But we're going to look at some other things. Uh, unconventionally, if I might say so. Matthew chapter 20, look at verse number 20. Ah, I changed my mind. Look at verse number 17. And let's read a little more. It says, And Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, and when it says going up, that would normally indicate he was going north, but he wasn't. He was going south, it's just that he was going up the mountain. Okay? So Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, and he took the twelve disciples apart from all of the rest of the people that were with him in the way. And he said unto this twelve, look here, we go up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man, that was him, Jesus, shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and under the scribes, and they shall condemn him or me to death, and shall deliver him or me, Jesus talking, 
to the Gentiles to mock him and to scourge him and to crucify him. But you know what? On the third day, he shall rise again. Now verse 20. So on this trip, going up to Jerusalem, the road from Jericho, I think, then came to Jesus the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And Jesus said unto her, What wilt thou? Now, in Texan, he would say, What do you want? What do you want? And she said unto him, Grant, please, that these my two sons it happened to be James and John, okay? Grant that they may sit the one on thy right hand and the other on the left in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask. And I want to let that soak in a little bit because it's been my observation in life that most people don't know what they're talking about when they're talking about Scripture, even. And the reason they don't is they just repeat what they've heard some earlier generation say and that generation just repeated what some other generation said and so forth down the line rather than reading it for themselves and reasoning it out. Uh, one of Paul's statements um, uh, periodically he would say, let us reason together. And, and, and that's, that's, what he, that's what he tried to do to the Jews is he would, at all of these towns that, I don't have Paul's map up here, got Jesus' map, but all the towns that Paul would go to, first place he would go would be to the synagogue to reason with these Jews how the Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah. And he, he failed uh, most of the time. He had more success dealing with um, let, let, me, let me go back. I, that's this thought just came. This is not something I prepared to talk about today, but uh, give you a little background or whatever. And you're all familiar. All of all of this is not a mystery. But on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter two, there's a whole list of countries where Jewish fellows devoted Jewish fellows had made the trip from their variety of places to Jerusalem to celebrate the day of Pentecost. And they heard with their own ears in their own native language from those other places. Okay, so those, when the day of Pentecost celebration was over, Paul hadn't even been saved yet. Paul was, he was, he was going around 
uh, grabbing every Christian he could get a hold of and dragging them to jail or at least to be punished in some sort of way, trying to persuade them to deny the name of Jesus of Nazareth. That was the, that was the, the thinking of the day. Now today we're talking about challenging conventional thinking. Okay? Now, Paul eventually changed. And I'm going to say eventually, I don't know the number of days that passed from the day of Pentecost of when he was going up to Damascus and the light shone on him and the voice spoke to him and, and, he, and he, he got saved. But then he went off and uh, for three years searched the scriptures. I think it was three years. Searched the scriptures just to see how he had missed the fact that the Messiah had come. All right. My point here is that the 3,000 that heard with their own ears on the day of Pentecost went back home to all of these places. And, and, and they had a head start on Paul. It's just that none of them was Paul. But they were talking to their neighbors, talking to their relatives. They were talking to their Jewish people at their synagogues, uh, telling them what they had experienced and so forth. Anyway, the point is, there were two, two count them, two established religions. One was Jewish, and the other was heathen, idolatry. And everywhere that Paul went, the people were, were worshiping idols. But Paul came, and, and there, there was a 20-year or so head start on Paul by the 3,000 who went 15... 15 for each. How many would that make? I don't know, 15 into 3,000. That'd be a couple hundred different places that 15 people went. And I'm just throwing these numbers out. I don't know what the numbers were. Some would have been more than 15, probably. Some would have been less, depending on the size of the community. But anyway, what they did and what Paul did when he was making his trips, was that he introduced a third religion. Now, there was Judaism, there was idolatry, and now there's Christianity. Hallelujah for that. Hallelujah for that. Now, these sons of Zebedee that I'm reading to you about in the book of Matthew, chapter 20, verse 20, uh, which was unconventional for me to start there because we're studying in the book of Luke. But, but the, these, these people were basically being converted by Jesus himself from being Jewish to being Christians. And so... Hey, John, I hate to challenge you so early, but the, 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 the New Testament mind of, like, the Christians in the New Testament, their mind wasn't that they were starting a new religion. It was the continuation of the existing religion. Uh, I, I don't know that that's what you you're not saying that I know. No, I know, I'm not know. saying that. Yeah, I know. It's just in the mind now of us now we see the two as two separate religions, but in their mind, they weren't starting a new religion. It was just a continuation of 
the Old Testament, the fulfillment of the promises of the Old Testament. And so they're, it's the same religion, same God, same everything. They're Paul, just, Paul thought that after he went off and studied for three additional years. Right. And, but and, in his mind you know, at that, the Jews' but, mind, they thought it was a, a false religion. But the fellows that he went to in the synagogue, the Jewish fellows there, and tried to reason together with them, they didn't accept that. They didn't accept that. So this is a, I'm still going to say, even while you've got water in your mouth, I'm going to say. Let's see yeah. how long it'll take. I don't, don't spit it out now. But he, we, 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 we now we've got uh, Judaism, and we've got idolatry, and we've got Christianity. And Christianity is available to these idolaters. I think Ju Judaism is idolatry too. And well, that's exactly right. But you have two. You but, have Christianity and you have idolatry. That's all you got. <laughs> you don't have three. You only have one or no, two. No, no. I said um, they, they, uh, the Jews were still bringing their little lambs and their little oxes and their little calves and and offering sacrifices and doing the things that they had, had done for generations. And Paul is now trying to teach them, you don't have to do that anymore because the Messiah has come. I don't, they didn't really do that in the synagogue. They just only did that in the, in the temple. In the temple. They didn't do that in the synagogues. They did it, they did it uh, on, the, on the, the highest hill they could find nearby. They went to worship and they built an altar and they burned their calves uh, and oxen and whatever it was that they were sacrificing to God. Well, my point here is that uh, in Matthew chapter 20, verse 22, right at the beginning, Jesus answered and said, You don't know what you're asking. Ye know not what ye ask. And the point here simply is that that was unconventional. They, they, they were expecting, um, at that point, they were expecting the... Um, uh, the um, um, uh, I, right now I'm having a senior moment and I can't think uh, of the word I need but uh, they were th uh, thinking that Jesus was going to set up his government right now while he's here and so she was asking for her two sons to be able to sit one on his right side and one on his left side. Let's go now uh, and do the conventional thing and study the book of Luke. And I'd like for you, even though our lesson is in verse uh, chapter 14, I'd like for you to look at chapter 1 again in uh, Luke. And let me read to you, just, to, just as a reminder of what it is that we're studying here. Starting with the first verse and just reading uh, four verses. It says, For as much as many have taken in hand, many have, have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration. That means they have many, many for as much as many people have written about this, of those things, they've written about those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. Well, it seemed good to me also, Luke says. I had spare time. 
So, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, wow, well, Paul, Paul, I mean, I'm sorry, Luke uh, thought a lot of himself in verse 3, yeah, that he had perfect understanding of all things from the very first to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. So, you've been instructed because of all the people in, in verse 1 that have already declared or set forth in order a declaration. He's been, Theophilus been instructed of those things. And we're going to look at those in chapter 14 today. So turn now to chapter 14 um, and let's um, look at that a while and uh, um, see what we can get Tom stirred up about. Too late. <laughs> Too late? Yeah. Oh, no. More than 30 minutes to get this stirred up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. <laughs> we got 35. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> you got 35. And we'll go 10 after, so. That's 45 minutes. We almost got our hour back. Yeah. Uh, there's, there, there's another place. I'm, I'm skipping. <laughs> some other stuff that I uh, wanted to because of, uh, of of the time passing so fast. But we get to chapter 14, verse 1. And it says, And it came to pass as he went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day, that they watched him. They were looking at him pretty close. And look here, behold, there was a certain man before him which had the dropsy. Now let me tell you, in the, in the commentaries, there are suggestions that this man that had the dropsy was planted there by the Pharisees, brought him there on purpose to see what, Jesus would do, and and they thought uh, they thought correctly that yeah Jesus Jesus will heal him Jesus will heal him and he'll do it on the Sabbath day and that's against the law. Uh, so they they were looking for something to blame him for. And that's why they were watching him at the end of verse 1. And behold, there was a certain man before him which had the dropsy. And my understanding of the definition of dropsy is that it's a, some kind of a disease that causes legs and arms to swell and makes it hard for a person to get around. Uh, and they just, they just can't function normally. And so here was such a fella, and verse 3 says, Jesus answering spake unto the lawyers and the Pharisees, saying, is it okay to heal on the Sabbath day? Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? It's kind of like Jesus knew why they put this guy here or why they invited him or whatever. And Jesus knew he was going to do it no matter what they said. Uh, but they held their peace. Verse 4 says they held their peace and Jesus took him 
That's the guy with the dropsy. I don't know where he took him. I think that means that he laid hands on him. I, I, don't, I don't think that means he moved him out of the place where he was and took him somewhere. But it says that he healed him. <laughs> and then let him go. So when he put hands on him, he apparently gripped him in some way and held him there and healed him. And when he was healed and the swelling went down, Jesus was let loose. So now he answers his own question to them that he had asked earlier, is it okay to heal on the Sabbath day? He says, verse 5, Which of you shall have an ass or an ox fallen into a pit or a ditch and will not straightway pull him out? even on the Sabbath day. They would have compassion for an animal in distress, even on the Sabbath day. He says, what's one of you chief priests and scribes wouldn't do that for an animal? So what's the difference if I do it for a human being? animal, this fellow with the dropsy. Well, verse 6, they could not answer him again to these things. So I'm suspecting there was a little pause or silence there. And then he began to teach. He saw a teaching moment. Verse 7 starts a new paragraph. And it says, And he put forth a parable to those which were invited there for bread on the Sabbath. He put forth a parable when he marked how they chose out the chief rooms, saying unto them, When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be invited. Verse 9. And he that invited you and him come and say to thee, give this man your place. And you begin with shame to take the lowest room. Now, let me go back. I, I, I read it to you in the King John Version. Um, let me go back and read it in the King James Version here. It says, When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. And he that bade thee and him Come and say to thee, give this man place, and thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. Now see, the conventional thinking uh, is everybody wants to be first. Everybody wants to win. Nobody wants to give respect to the next person, let them go first, whatever. And when I say that, there are obviously those of us who have learned Christianity 
uh, know how Jesus feels about this sort of thing. And, and us men who are gentle men will certainly hold the door open for some lady, any lady, doesn't matter. We, we, it's, just the, it's just the position that we have and we understand that that's the thing that we do. So those things are conventional wisdom for Christians, but let me tell you, I've, uh, many times I've observed fellows who have just gone right on out the door or gone in the door and there'd be a lady coming right there next to, uh, and, and they don't pay any attention to them at all and won't, won't, give, won't give place to... Knock them over so they can get in first? Uh, it could be that. Leave them out in the cold. Yeah, all of those kinds of things. So Jesus says to them, verse 10, When thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room. Now, really, what is, uh, in our uh, ling ling use of the English language, <laughs> it's, when you come to church, you sit on the back seat. Don't go up to the front seat and sit. You sit on the back seat. And then if the person that invited you wants you to sit on the front seat, you'll say, why don't all you guys come up here and sit on the front seat? And give you an invitation to do that. I'm... I'm presupposing some things here, but Jesus, uh, let me go back and start again with verse 10. When thou art bidden to, bidden to go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, Friend, go up higher. Then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. Now, let me tell you, uh, I'll give you the personal story. Uh, we have a son-in-law who uh, is, uh, uh, was raised in a pastor's home who pastored the same church for <coughs> 40 years or something like that over in Georgia. And we went there once, well, more than once, but this particular time we were there on Sunday. Most of the time we tried to not be there on Sunday. But we were this time on Sunday, and, and uh, we were told at the, at the front door, we've got special chairs for you, special place for you to sit. So don't go sit down. We'll, we'll show you to your seat. Well, you know, we would have sat somewhere towards the back, um, out of sight, that sort of thing. But when the usher was called to take us to our special seats, they put us right on the front row, right in front of the pulpit. And that was their way of... of honoring us and and even uh, the pastor our our in-laws when he began to uh, have his part of the service he started out by recognizing us and introducing us to his whole congregation of 1500 people or something like that <laughs> And we were, we were, we had our special seat, all right. We didn't want that special seat. We, <laughs> we wanted to be back there in the crowd somewhere and not uh, so conspicuous. But that's not the thing that Jesus is talking about here. 
Uh, and in number 11, verse number 11, he continues and says, For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased. Well, even though we didn't exalt ourselves by going up and sitting on the front row, we felt like we were exalted and that everybody out there thought, we, well, we're better than they are because we get, you know, we, I'm, uh, I'm just rattling here about this sort of thing that that I that I have experienced some of this sort of thing. So verse eleven again: For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Well. Uh, all of you guys on the back seat get to be exalted. And, and it, you know, you people on the front seat. Come on back here, guys. <laughs> Can't hear back there. Huh? <laughs> no room. Yeah. It's not loud enough for him to hear back there. So, yeah, but, but I'm just making the illustration of conventional thinking. I'm not, I'm not uh, asking any of you to draw any conclusions about where you're sitting in this class uh, compared to this scripture. Verse 12, he goes on and he says, Then said he also to him that bade him. Now he's talking to go, go, back, go back to verse 1. It says, It came to pass as he went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees. Okay. So verse 12, Jesus said, to that chief Pharisee. And see, it doesn't say that. It says, then said he also to him that bade him or invited him. Okay, well, that was the chief Pharisee. So Jesus says to him, when you make a dinner or a supper, and I could add, or a lunch, Picnic. Supper is lunch. Yeah. Call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also invite you, and a recompense be made to you. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. Now, let me make a, 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 I don't know what to call it, a, um, a self-justifying comment because we often have guests for dinner and and, and later those guests invite us to dinner. It happens a bunch uh, in our society. It's just the way that we do it. Now, at this, and, I, and I'm not, I'm not going to criticize that. I'm guilty of doing that. Uh, but the point here 
that Jesus is making, and I think you all probably received uh, mail from the Salvation Army and from the Star of Hope and from whomever during the Christmas season to contribute something. And, and you should do that. Now, it's, it's okay that instead of doing that to the Salvation Army or the Red Cross or the Star of Hope or whomever, just do it to your church on a benevolence need of some sort. Uh, I had a fellow, I had a conversation with a fellow uh, that, that used to come to church here. He doesn't anymore because, uh, I don't know all of the becauses, but I know the major because, which is uh, he and his wife divorced. He continued to come here and she disappeared. Uh, but he remarried. And when he remarried, he remarried a Catholic lady who doesn't want to come to a Pentecostal church. So he goes to Catholic mass now with her. But he told me that he gave, and, and we, we, were, we were having a conversation along these lines. It's not that he just out, you know, came out and told me this because he wanted me to know. But he told me a large sum of money that he had given to Pastor Hogan to distribute to families in uh, the Christmas season uh, that was needed here. Actually, he didn't tell me that he distributed it to Pastor, or he gave it to Pastor Hogan. And what he said to me was, he, gave, he says, I gave money to our church. And I says, well, let me ask you, who, who do you consider to be our church? You know, I thought maybe he gave it to the Catholic church. And he said, well, spring first. I still consider that to be my church. Even though he's not attending here, he's going somewhere else. Uh, but he was providing... And you can do the same through our church, uh, and, and they will take care of needs as they arise. Uh, on the other hand, there's nothing wrong with you giving individually to someone else that you see that is in need of, of whatever sort. And it's, you, don't, you don't have to so much have a feast for them, but you can buy them a hamburger or McDonald's or something. Uh, you, you can provide in some way some relief for them. And verse 14 says, And thou shalt be blessed if you do that, because those people cannot recompense you. For you shall be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. So in the next life, we get the reward that we would, uh, we, we, we would get or that's due us because we have helped somebody that uh, is in an unfortunate situation. Just... New paragraph, verse 15. So when one of them that sat at meat with him heard him say these things, that person said unto Jesus, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. In other words, there was somebody nearby 
showing his religiosity. That he, he, had, he was in a house of a chief Pharisee. And blessed be we that come here and break bread together. And Jesus responds in verse 16, said unto him, Let me say this. A certain man made a great supper and invited many. Invited, let's go back to... Uh, um, to verse 12. Okay. Verse 16 says, A certain man made a great supper and invited many. Verse 12, I'm going to suggest to you that those he invited were his friends, his brethren, his kinsmen, his rich neighbors. That's who all he invited. Verse 17, and he sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. Dorothy's got the table set. Come on. Verse 18, and they all... Now the all is, going back to 12, his friends, his brethren, his kinsmen, his rich neighbors. They all, verse 18, with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, Man, I bought a piece of ground and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused from the supper. Verse 19. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused from the supper. And number 20. Verse 20, another said, I've married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. Verse 21, so that servant came and he showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house being angry, Now, he was angry because he had invited his friends, his neighbors, his kinsmen, his brethren, and none of them would come. So that servant came, verse 21, and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, well, okay then. Go out. See, I'm, I'm reading from the King John Version again. <laughs> Add, adding words. Said, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded. And we found as many of them as we could, and yet there, there still is room. Verse 23, So the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden 
shall taste of my supper. So he's saying the ones I invited, they know, they know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't feed them now even if they showed up. None of them going to taste of my supper. I'm, I'm going to give it to the poor and, you know, the, this whole list of things here. Well, let me tell you what this is uh, a description of, is that, that when, when Jesus came as the Son of the Almighty God, the Messiah, and he was rejected by all of the Jews that were expecting him to come. They just wasn't expecting him to come the way that he did. They didn't recognize him. They rejected him. They wouldn't come to his supper. So go get the Gentiles. Boy, aren't, aren't we blessed? that we now get to go to the supper that all of the Jewish people that rejected Christ is not going to be able to go to. Um, the only exception to that, and I don't, and there's not scripture for it here, but uh, I am aware that there are some Jews that have now, in our generation, have accepted Jesus. They believe that Jesus was the Son of God and that he was the Messiah. Now those, I think, will get to go to the supper. But uh, the ones that were living back then that when the time of the resurrection of the just, go back to verse 14 right at the end, it says, at the resurrection of the just. So when the resurrection of the just happens, um, that group of people, uh, they're going to be still undisturbed and not resurrected. And then they're not going to be uh, a, a bit of movement of the, of, the, of the grave coming up, opening up or whatever. And I don't know exactly how that will happen. There are so many things in uh, Scripture that uh, represent different things than what they were saying. Go back and, uh, and look at verse 16 there. Jesus just started talking about some certain man. He didn't, he didn't know of a man. He just wanted to, uh, he just wanted to outline to these people who had come to the home of the chief priest that this, what, this is what will happen under these circumstances. And and look, uh, I have come and and bid you all. Uh, he had been thrown out of the synagogue uh, in his hometown of Nazareth. He had been rejected. He had all sorts of things um, uh, negative happening to him. Uh, but, 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 but this, uh, uh, this lesson where Jesus is challenging conventional thinking, he did, he, all, it, all that they're saying is that he didn't act like everybody else. He didn't come along. He wasn't born as a, a regular little old Jewish baby and raised like a regular little old Jewish baby. Uh, and when he got old enough to 
learn or to preach or to whatever. And I don't know how all of the knowledge came to Jesus from a little bitty baby, but somewhere uh, along the line as he growed, grew up and matured uh, as a human being, person, he, he had the ability to know what y'all are thinking. In the scripture, in many places, it says he know he knew their thoughts. He could say that, and I I don't know how that was, but he used these kinds of stories. A certain man, I'm reading verse 16. A certain man made a great supper and bade many. Well, he just was. Uh, I'm going to say making that up to tell the story to illustrate the point that he's talking about Christianity here. He's talking about uh, uh, the, the, okay, the continuation of Judaism. Uh, just uh, the Messiah had come. But there was a lot of other Jewish people who wouldn't accept that, and they just continued in their old ways. So some of the ones who were continuing in their old ways were at that chief priest's, chief Pharisee's house on that Sabbath day breaking bread. And and one, I'm, I'm, this is probably sacrilegious, and I shouldn't even say it, but I, I'm I'm guilty. Verse uh, 13 says, "When one of them, I see, I right there, I would put, and one 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 of those nitwits." that sat at meat with him, he just thought, here's a good time I can show off. I can say, blessed is he that breaks bread on the Sabbath day in God's name. That's basically what it says. And, and, and when we do that, breaking bread on the Sabbath days, and in verse 15, we, we, if we just break bread on the Sabbath day, we shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. There's more to it. You got to do it on not just the Sabbath day, but uh, yeah, Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and. I have to think about that because I never took that verse 15 that way at all. Okay. I, I don't, I'm not saying it wrong. One, I have to think about one, that. One of my uh, uh, purposes in life is to make, uh, in Sunday school, is crazy. to make people think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've, I've been thinking about things you said two or three weeks ago and studying on. Good. Which I've been wanting to bother you about that, but I'm not going to do it right now. But these kind of things, I like to, I like to, uh, I like to hear other perspectives because then it makes me think. But I've never taken it that way. I always thought that as a positive thing, and you're saying that's a negative thing. There in verse 15. Yeah. I've I'm, always taken. I'm that saying that was a, that was a show off, is what that was. Yeah, and uh, I I uh, never took it that way. But, well, I'm sorry you missed it, Tom. Okay. Well, I, I hadn't missed it now because you showed it to me. Yeah, yeah. I didn't miss it, see? Yeah. I came and I sat in the chief seats here in the front. There you go, you did. You <laughs> sat in the lowest, you sat in the lowest room all the way in back the in the back. I sat in the seats and I got it now. <laughs> Any other thoughts or comments or... We're going to continue next week. <laughs> Uh, in our study of the book of Luke. And if there are no more comments, we'll pray now. Lord, we are indeed grateful and thankful to you for your goodness to us and your mercy to us, your blessings on us. 
thankful for this place which we can come to to read your word and to discuss it, talk about it with our friends. Thank you for the friends that come, Lord. We come not only to learn about you, but to worship you. We're going to worship you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, who indeed is our Savior. Amen. Amen. God bless you for being in his house today.